you in a moment. Starting the we're starting the video on YouTube. Okay, now we're ready. And we still have a couple minutes, so I'm gonna wait a, a minute or two before. Okay, now we're ready. Oops, there's an echo. We still have a I'm going to turn the waiting room off, okay? All right, I think everybody's in from the waiting room. We're still a couple minutes away from 730. Uh, but you know, I'm going to go ahead and get started since we're on a bit of a tighter schedule tonight. So I want to welcome everybody. I'm Vivian New, I'm the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I wanted to welcome you to our talk this evening. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about CNPS and some of our upcoming activities for our chapter. So CNPS is a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965, and we have over 10,000 members now, over 35 chapters, which are all over California, and now also includes Baja, California. Our chapter covers Santa Clara County or, and southern San Mateo up to about San Bruno Mountain. And the goal of our organization is to save California's native plants and habitats. And we do that through science, education, conservation, and gardening. Uh, we're really working hard to get native plants into people's gardens and uh, working to conserve them out in the wild. So if that sounds good to you and you're not currently a member, we would love to have you join. And if you join, not only do you help us with our mission, but you'll also receive two great publications, Primancha and Flora, and our chapter newsletter, if you choose our chapter as your, your primary chapter, or one of your two primary chapters. And you'll also get discounts on various events and uh, native plant nurseries and a variety of other things. So please join us if you're not currently a member, and you can do that by going to cnps.org slash join. Uh, we have a bunch of other talks coming up, although this is the, our very last talk of 2020, but we'll be starting the new year uh, with a talk on the birds and habitats of Renzel Pond, which is a pond in Palo Alto, and that'll be by Bob Siegel on January 8th. Um, we have another talk the following week on Manzanitas and all their, her relations by Kate Marionchild, who is the author of Secrets of the Oak Woodland, and that's on Wednesday, January 13th. And then we have a, a real favorite of our chapters, which is not exactly a talk. It's our annual photo sharing meeting. 
and our, our members night and we're going to be doing that on Wednesday, January 20th. And if you're interested in participating, um, there'll be information on our website and in the blazing star on how to do that. Uh, and then in, at the beginning of February, we have a gardening talk on supporting biodiversity with native plants by Shelki Tao. And that will be followed by a talk on the natural history of San Bruno Mountain by David Nelson and Doug Allhouse on February 17th. So there's a lot of great talks coming up and we're working on scheduling more. So please stay tuned. And you can stay tuned. Oh, whoops, actually, sorry, before I talk about how you can get this great information. I also wanted to make sure that you know about our nursery and our st online store. So we have our chapter nursery is online now, open 24 by seven, you can shop. Um, in December, we actually have a sale going on on Cobb Mountain Lupin, uh, California Buckwheat and Howard McMahon Manzanita. It's starting to rain. So this is a great time to plant. And if you're interested in these or any of our many other plants, all you have to do is go to our uh, that this site that's listed here or go to our website, cnps-scv.org. And there's a link there to get to the store and you can shop and buy your plants. And then we can either deliver them to you or you can come by our nursery on, with a scheduled time um, to pick your plants up. And not only can you get plants, but you can also get t-shirts, books and other things as well. So now, uh, if you want to know what's going on and what's coming up and like things when we put plants on sale, uh, make sure you're on our chapter news mailing list. And if you're a member, you may not be on it. You have to choose to join. It's a Google group and the information on how to join is right there on the slide. Send an email to cnps-scv-news plus subscribe at googlegroups.com. Um, that's a, a long string and you, all you have to do is go to cnps-scv.org and there is information there on how to join. And if you are enjoying these talks and you like messing around with Zoom, we would love to have more help. So if you're interested in helping with this and uh, behind the scenes, for example, we have Judy Fennerty who's running our chat. And so uh, if you're interested in doing uh, this or, or helping with anything, please get in touch with us. Uh, or you can call, or, sorry, you can send email to Johanna Kwan or Madeline Morrow. Their email addresses are here on the slide. And our program tonight is a wonderful talk on Project 467, Enhancing Native Plant Diversity at Edgewood. Um, it's by St Dr. Stuart Weiss, who is the chief scientist at, at Creekside Science, which provides scientific and conservation ex expertise to diverse organizations as they cope with the rapidly changing 21st century environment. He's researched the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly and Serpentine Grasslands since 1979 and has authored numerous scientific papers concerning climate and microclimate, population dynamics, nitrogen deposition, and conservation ecology. Creekside Science executes many hands on restoration projects, including butterfly reintroductions, propagation of endangered plants, and habitat monitoring and management. His research and advocacy were instrumental in the development of Santa Clara Valley, the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Plan, and he's a science advisor for the Bay Area Conservation Lands Network. And you can find more information about Creekside Science at creeksidescience.com. So I'm going to hand it over to Stu, but before I do that, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows they should mute your mic their microphones. If you're not currently muted, please do so. If you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to ask them at any time by typing into the chat box. So please don't unmute yourself to ask the questions. Just type your questions in the chat box. And then at, uh, at, at the end of the talk, Judy will be reading your questions to Stu. So whether you're on YouTube or on Zoom, just type your questions into the chat. And we're actually, I, I put, we're gonna finish by 9 p.m., but actually we're planning to wrap up by 8.30 today because Stu has another engagement. So. Uh, we will be done in about an hour. And uh, this program is being recorded on YouTube. So if you want to watch it again later, you can do that. All right, Stu, take it away. Hey, I keep getting everything lined up there. All right, I'm in full screen mode. OK, so uh, it's always a pleasure to address my local CMPS chapter. We have a long history going back to about 1990. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Project 467, 
and um, basically, what can we do at Edgewood to increase the coefficient of beauty, which is that sense you get when the flowers are just so gorgeous, you get that tickle feeling in your eyes. So uh, we're almost all familiar with Edgewood Natural Preserve. Um, we call it Area 467, um, not because there are space aliens around, um, although sometimes I think like Ken Himes and Paul Heipel uh, might qualify as being from another planet, but that's said with great affection. It's uh, Edgewood is 467 acres. And uh, the idea is to look at the entire 467 acres of Edgewood and see what we can do to enhance native plant diversity. We all know the story of the golf course, uh, save that. We saved, save Edgewood Park morphed into Friends of Edgewood in 1993. And uh, to put it mildly, it's a very high capacity friends group. Um, and I think that's expressed in what we're, uh, the work we've done there. So Edgewood is most famous for its serpentine grasslands, uh, very nutrient poor soils with uh, amazing wildflower displays. Close up from far away. You know, really high diversity on a very small scale. And uh, it is home to the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly, which is almost an icon of Edgewood. And uh, lives, you know, habitat in the serpentine grassland, but the, the freeway in the background has led to long-term trouble for the habitat because of the nitrogen deposition from the exhaust of 100,000 cars going by every day at high speeds. Um, and the butterfly did go extinct back in 2002. So since then, we've done research. Uh, we've learned how to manage the checker spot habitat in the face of the nitrogen deposition by mowing. So the right side of this photo um, was mowed uh, the year before. Um, notice how much less grass and more flowers there are. So we've implemented uh, rotational mowing across the serpentine grassland to maintain the uh, flowers and keep the grass down. Uh, we've been translocating butterflies there. There's no, been no translocation since 2017. Uh, the population is barely hanging on, um, which is still there, but it's maybe a low hundreds at best. Um, a slightly more optimistic uh, good story, we have the San Mateo thorn mint, uh, which was only known from a small patch at Edgewood. Um, this photograph on the right is more plants than existed in 2009. So in 2009, there are 249 plants in one site occupying about 27 square meters. As of 2020, after years of uh, seed increase and habitat management, and outplanting of seeds, we counted 43,000 plants in six different sites, 500 plus square meters are occupied by the thorn mint. And we go back to the original site, uh, less than 50 were in the original occupied habitat, which has shrunk to nine square meters. So um, I think we can say we've saved this plant from extinction. Uh, there's a good account of it uh, written by myself uh, in the latest issue of Fremontia. But we want to look beyond the serpentine to what we're calling the fertile grasslands. These are the grasslands that are on uh, sandstone and gray wacky and chert and uh, other, uh, other rocks that aren't so nutrient limited as the serpentine grassland, but are unfortunately completely, almost completely dominated by non-native species. So uh, the weed warriors have been working the fertile grasslands for about 30 years. And uh, the macro weeds, those plants you can pull individually are really on the run. 
uh, tens of thousands of volunteer hours over these 30 years. And it's a really incomparable achievement um, that is the envy of every other park in uh, California. So uh, project 467, the sub-project Green Grass, um, our goals are to reduce non-native annual grass and fork cover, increase native cover, and the strategy to do this is to occupy the space with native perennials. Um, we're not going to get those dazzling displays of annuals that we get in serpentine grassland in these more fertile grasslands, but we can do a lot with the native perennial uh, grasses and forbs. Develop site-specific recipes that are most effective. Propagate key species by seed and uh, think about this as a long-term process so we don't have to do it all at once. We can bite off little chunks and do a really good job. So uh, a lot of funding for this has come from Friends of Edgewood and we got a California CDFA uh, weed management area grant. Uh, the capacity of Friends of Edgewood was uh, displayed when we were in a position to move really fast on what was basically a first come first serve grant proposal. So we're really after what have been termed micro weeds. Uh, this is species like the Brachypodium distachyum, purple false brome, a little annual grass. It's that pale green uh, on the left and it creates a really thick impenetrable thatch after it dries out. Um, just occupies a lot of space and that smothers uh, the native species. And of course, there's other annual grasses and forbs, all the usual suspects um, that can't be dealt with by hand pulling by the weed warriors. So we uh, started off thinking about, well, spring mowing, you know, it works in the serpentine. We can knock back the Italian ryegrass for a perfect, a good timing. Um, so we tried that with, in the fertile grasslands. Um, and we found that if we target the avena, the wild oats, we get a large increase in the brachypodium, which comes after the we target the brachypodium, we increase non-native forbs like the erodium, hypocorus, et cetera, you name them. And we get into what I call the weed of the month club. You know, it's just we're not getting anywhere. So we need a somewhat different strategy here. So we did do some experiments at Edgewood back in 2012, 20, uh, 2014 with this method called hydromechanical pulverization, formerly known as obliteration. And it's basically pressure washing the, the, the grassland to uh, get rid of all the above ground uh, growth and thatch, uh, which is right after germination. And that uh, gets rid of all the annuals or large part of the annuals that have emerged and it leaves a nice open seed bed and then the native perennial grasses uh, come roaring back and native perennial forbs do too with the lack of competition. So th this is an example of a site that was uh, hit by HMP and seed in 2014 and this is the results of 2018. Uh, really about 10% cover of yarrow and uh, 17% cover of uh, media gracillums, a little par weed. Um, and this is by far the most successful method we've come across. So hitting the species right after germination, hitting the grassland after germination and getting rid of the first crop of annuals and then taking advantage of that um, as a seedbed and also the native perennials really take advantage. So this site here had 30% native cover, which is pretty amazing for a fertile grassland. We had five native perennial forb species and 10% of it was yarrow, which was seeded in. Eight native annual forb species and 17% native annual cover. That's really remarkable for a fertile grassland in California. 
we've done it elsewhere. Um, as I say, you eliminate post-germination annuals in the early growing season. Existing native perennials just expand vegetatively in response to the lack of competition. Uh, it can be really remarkable if you have a good, you have a good nucleus of native perennials. At, at the Horse Park at Woodside, you could see the results from hundreds of yards away where we got a cycle of ranunculus, then Cicerinchium turned to blue, and then the stipo turned it purple, like purple needle grass. And you could see the square where we had done it from a large distance away. And it creates a good seed bed for natives, as I said. Uh, another thing we're gonna try is this close trim mowing or scrub mowing. It's using string cutters, uh, get into the dirt a little bit hit the newly germinating annuals and maybe we'll have similar effect as HMP um, without the water and specialized equipment. So it may be a lot more economical, faster, less expensive. We're trying it all this year. We have eight experimental blocks set up. Uh, there's 10 on this, but we dropped two for cost reasons. And within each of those blocks, we're gonna do the following treatments. We're gonna do the HMP, the HMP, Plus seeding, um, a lot of uh, we got commercially available San Mateo County uh, seeds from Hedgerow Farms. Uh, the close mowing and the close mowing mowing with seeding. We're going to do a spring mow. We have a control, and then within the unseeded plots, we're going to do small plots of what we call boutique seeds. Uh, that are uh, generated indigenously at Edgewood. Um, this is a project that has really grabbed people's imagination. So we have field collection of seeds. The seeds can go to three places. There's Edgewood Farms, which is a series of raised beds uh, behind, the, uh, behind the bathrooms at the uh, uh, main entrance there. We can also send some to Hedgerow Farms for a seed increase. It's expensive, but you get a lot of seed. Or they can go into the native garden or they can go back into the field. And what we really want, we want to get this virtuous cycle down here in the field where we generate enough seeds that we can collect and spread them in, in the field uh, without having to go through the, the garden uh, seed increase. So uh, it's a long-term process and we're off to a really great start. This was the... Uh, seeds we produced in 2019 that are uh, going into the field uh, this year. So how many were collected and uh, yeah, so we're in uh, pretty good shape to experiment with our own seeds. And we really have to thank Perry McCarty uh, for grabbing this project. So then you know, it's, we, we want to understand how does the biodiversity in Edgewood work. So we did a series of more than 80 rapid assessment plots, or RAP, and you know, asking what is out there and where, and as you'll see, you know, why is it there? Uh, here are my RAP team buddies, uh, Perry and Perry McCarty and Alf. Bengler, um, and we every day we'd go out and check out another part of the park or series of plots, and I started calling it our voyage of discovery because we never knew exactly what we were going to find when we looked really closely at the fertile grasslands. Again, this is all concentrated in the fertile grasslands, not the serpent. Um, we had a good time out there, I have to admit. You know, field work is just... Uh, Awesome. Here's our data sheet. It's, um, you know, we were using the CNPS Releve method, somewhat simplified, in about a five meter radius circle around the central point. We took, it would take us about 30 minutes per plot to identify all the species and assign them to cover classes. Um, some plots would go really fast because there weren't very many species there. Others would take a, a bit longer because they were very species rich. And, you know, 
here are some of the things we were finding. We, we got into some of the wetter areas in the grasslands. So we have this marsh baccarus uh, on the western part of the park, and then some stands of grasses like the uh, California oak grass and the moist swales. And what we found, 146 species in our plots. There were 18 native perennial grasses, rushes, and sedges, 37 native perennial forbs, 43 native annual forbs, some of which were really spilling over from the serpentine grassland. 15 non-native annual grasses. Uh, we're getting on, we have the light side above, now we're on the dark side, as we were very fond of saying. Uh, 33 non-native annual forbs. So there's a lot of biodiversity out there and a lot of the species are, uh, are natives. So just as a really quick summary, this is showing all of the plots ranked from the most native, which are in the blue uh, bars. Uh, the different uh, guilds of native species. So plot 72 had, uh, was virtually 100% native. Um, all the way over to plot 67, which was like almost 100% non-native. So we get quite a wide range of uh, native diversity and native cover out there um, to work with. So you know, a lot of material to think to explore how the plants are distributed out there. So you know, here's some of the favorites we would come across. We have the two species of Calicordis, um, the uh, Clarkia rubicunda was always a favorite. A little Plectritis in the middle is one of the rarer perennial bunch grasses, the Melica californica. Then everybody loves uh, narrow-leaf mule's ears. Uh, down on the lower left is the Zeltnara, growing in kind of moist swales. And we have two species of uh, Cydalsia, um, the Diplocyca, the annual, is uh, much more common. And we, we have very few uh, of the Cydalsia malviflora, but that's something we really want to figure out how to increase. Also, like amazing stands of blue-eyed grass. Um, some really nice glomatium are out in the fertile grasslands. And then some beautiful stands of sky lupin, the pinus bicolor. And then, uh, you know, there's a nice little moth on a ranunculus. Um, I really appreciated the insect photos that were on in uh, Vivian's introduction there. Uh, just amazing stands of purple needle grass. Um, there's another plant insect thing going there with the uh, golden yarrow. Um, you know, some large perennials like the pearly everlasting and the uh, bush lupin behind it, silver bush lupin. And then some, you know, really interesting stands of uh, grass. Uh, Perennial bunch grass, Stipa lepida, foothill needle grass is really quite common out at Edgewood in these slightly moister areas. And then when we get into the really moist areas, we found some real treasures, a nice stand of a threatened western dwarf flax in a wetland area that uh, has a serpentine influence. And then uh, we found several stands of this long rayed brodea. Uh, which is a uh, local rarity in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Lots of stuff out there. Okay, so we have uh, we have all these data on our plots. How are we going to relate that to the environment? And this is where the voodoo of geographic information systems and terrain modeling. So we have this variable we generate called the topographic moisture index, which is a function of the upslope collecting area at a point. So you kind of trace the drainage back up according to the slopes and uh, correct that by the slope itself. So a flat area that has a lot of upslope drainage 
will be a darker blue on this map. And we kind of expanded it. We did an app the maximum within about a five meter radius because our plots were bigger than the fine scale digital elevation model we had. So that's one variable. So for example, we have down here, you know, here's, uh, here's the Yampa Meadow down in here, uh, the main swale and then some of the drainage is coming down. Uh, even some interesting narrow drainages coming off the main ridge. Then we also calculate solar radiation based on the geometry of slope and aspect and horizon shading. So this is the March 21st insulation. And this is basically the north versus south slopes. So up here at Inspiration uh, Point, we have you know, steep south facing slopes that get a lot of solar radiation. But if we go over on the other side, we get steep north facing slopes that get a lot less. And you know, any botanist out there will tell you you want to you know, look for plants on all the different aspects in an area because the composition changes. Then we have the bedrock geology. Um, yeah, we have a lot of serpent tonight, but uh, there's uh, greenstone and gray wacky, these interesting sheer rocks, and uh, and just creates different soil chemistry. We took a lot of soil samples that we haven't uh, really uh, crunched the data on yet, so we'll understand the chemical composition. So we put all of these things together and we run it through a multivariate voodoo program called canonical correspondence analysis. So I'm actually gonna show a bunch of graphs here. And what it does is it arrays the plots and the species into uh, a, a sp two dimensional space that is defined by these three environmental factors here. The topographic moisture index runs this way, which means that these plots out here are the swale bottoms, the moist plots. These are the ones that are more upland. Everything is over on this side of that vector. Over here, we have our south facing slopes. Over here, we have our north facing slopes. So it, uh, it spreads out the species and the sites according to their composition and the uh, correlation of that composition with these environmental factors. So just to put it in species terms, here's how the native perennial grasses fall out in this uh, analysis. Over here, we have all of the ones that like moist habitats. We have the Horbra, the Hordean Brachyanthema, meadow barley. We have the Elemis uh, triticoides, the perennial ryegrass. We have uh, the juncus, the juns, and the carex are all over here. A little less to that side is the Danthonia californica and the Elemis glaucus. Then over here, uh, skewing towards higher solar radiation, the warmer slopes, not on the really moist areas are two species of stipa, the pulchra and the lepida. And so that's kind of the way this works. Um, and what's really nice is it does um, confirm your naturalist's understanding of where we find things. And then over here, we have the north slope plant uh, grasses, the Elemis multicetus, the Calaria macantha, and a little bit of a Grostis hallii. We look at the native perennial forbs, it's really diverse, it's really kind of messy, but over here we have our more wetland and moist meadow plants, uh, the Brodea elegans, the uh, um, Tritalia pedunculata, the Bacchus the glassii, um, then with the native annual forbs, it's kind of the same, the same thing. Over here, we have the plants that like the moist areas, the Castilea rubicundula, the butter and eggs. I think that's it. Well, and then uh, the Zeltnara, Muhlenbergii. And then over on the uh, warm slopes, we have the big stands of the Lupinus bicolor. 
So this gives us an understanding of what it, how the plants sort out so we can target our seeding and understand what plants are uh, you know, like feasible to grow in different areas. So this is the site-specific recipe. The non-native annual grasses, we go over to the dark side here. Uh, the one I really want to point out is the Brachypodium distachion, which likes the warmer slopes and the drier areas and becomes really quite dominant in those areas. And then the non-native annual forbs are kind of all over the place. Uh, notable is the, the Rumex crispus, again, you find that in a wet area. And then in the uh, driest sites, we find the Silene gallica. So we can see how the species themselves fall out across this among all the plots. So up here we have the Melia gracilis, which was the most abundant uh, native annual forb. We can see big concentration of it over here. It does get pretty widely distributed, but it's over here in the drier areas, areas that aren't too steep and tends to not be that abundant on the south facing slopes or over on this side of the March 21st. Our, uh, the dark side Brachypodium is really concentrated up here on the, uh, on the warm south facing slopes, but also uh, extends on the drier side of the topographic moisture gradient, although it's still present uh, in small abundance. The Hordium brachyanthema from uh, meadow barley find that over on the uh, wet areas where we have a high topographic moisture area. And then one of my favorites, and we're going to really work on increasing this one, is the Waithia angustifolia, which doesn't like the steep south facing slopes and likes areas of moderate moisture. So uh, we're getting an understanding of how the plant species themselves are distributed across these environmental gradients, which gives us a clue as to what the seed in where. Then, then we uh, did some work on mapping out particular individual plant species of interest. So, you know, the milkweeds, everyone knows there's milkweed out at Edgewood. Uh, I went out with Paul and Perry and we mapped out milkweeds and, you know, we, uh, it was really, really interesting to uh, see how extensive they were in Edgewood. Um, you know, here's Perry looking like he's getting ready to take flight like a milkweed seed. Um, Midsummer nectar sources, it's a magnet for insects. So here's a Ackman blue butterfly, and here's a tarantula hawk getting large amounts of nectar from the milkweeds. So when we went out and mapped it out, we came up with these patches of milkweed. And uh, as far as the monarch butterflies go, there were several adults observed in March and June. Uh, in August, we searched 1,000 plus stems and found no monarch larvae. In other years, there would be larvae out in that point at, out at that point of the year. And one of the really interesting things about the milkweed is that it's expanded with the removal of the yellow star thistle because the yellow star thistle is directly competing with it for that midsummer moisture. That's a really precious resource. So uh, this is something that's happening across the park as these macro weeds are being uh, removed and controlled, there are certain native species that are responding very strongly and increasing their uh, distribution and abundance. So I, you know, I, I have to talk about the monarch butterfly collapse that I'm sure everybody's heard about by now. Uh, unfortunately, this photograph contains maybe 5% of the total uh, monarch population in California this year. This was taken at Pismo State Beach. 
um, for multiple causes ranging from climate whiplash to toxic pesticides in the soup bowl of the Central Valley uh, to smoke and fires. Uh, the monarch butterfly population in the Western United States is in, in dire straits and has really collapsed. Um, we're all trying to figure out why and what we can do about it. So uh, hold on, hold those thoughts. Um, but we can do things at Edgewood to make it more hospitable to monarchs. We have a lot of milkweed, but it's also competing with a lot of non-native annual grasses like the Italian ryegrass. So we did a few places where we did experiments by mowing the ryegrass just as it was setting seed. We knocked off the stems of the milkweed at that point, but it re-sprouts really strongly, and we're hoping that we end up in the end with higher cover of milkweed. It also delayed the flowering phenology. So unmowed milkweeds were in full flower at this point. These ones that were mowed were just starting to flower again. So, uh, you know, it was really a pleasure to find out how much milkweed there was at Edgewood. Uh, it really surprised people. Where we found other opportunities for kind of spot treatments. So uh, here we have uh, down in the flats in the southern part of the park, nice stands of uh, native uh, perennial ryegrass. And then here we have non-native annual ryegrass. It really, really thick. So what we think is that we're going to just start mowing the uh, Italian ryegrass when we can stop its seed production and break up the thatch and hopefully we'll see vegetative spread of the native perennial ryegrass. So looking for opportunities like this where spot treatment can increase the native cover. We're also on the lookout for local rarities or even regional rarities. So this little polygon and light in the middle here is the distribution of erigeron. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I, my, my screen is being covered by the screen sharing thing. Um, anyway, it's the uh, Lesser California Rayless Fleabane. And it's a real outlier in the distribution um, that we have at Edgewood, and, you know, covers maybe half an acre or so. And this is thanks to the sharp eyes of Kenny Hickman. Um, the sharp eyes of all the people out at Edgewood, uh, it's just an amazing resource. And I really, really uh, appreciate working with everybody out there and getting stuff on the map and learning from you and teaching you and uh, just finding out more about um, area 467. So, you know, at Edgewood, famous for the high diversity of serpentine grassland wildflowers, and we're hoping we can uh, increase the coefficient of beauty on the uh, fertile grasslands. And, you know, being a scientist, I need good terminology. We have an I sub B. You'll hear me muttering I sub B, the coefficient of beauty. And, uh, you know, so we increase the blue eyed grass, we get some of the calicortis and the clarkia going, the uh, harvest brodia, mule's ears, well, everybody's favorites, nice stands of lupins, beautiful wetland stands of the brodia. And uh, one of the reasons I call it I sub B because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I'll leave you with that pun and take questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Stu. That's great. Um, so you got a few minutes for questions, right? Before you have to yeah, go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we've got a few, I was just organizing them. So why not use vinegar spring? Um, 
we have thought about the appropriate use of some herbicides and uh, I, I think the volumes of vinegar we would have to use might be a little excessive. Um, we may, you know, we may be trying other things down the future. In the future, we feel like we have a, you know, good evidence that these post-germination uh, kind of mechanical or hydromechanical treatments have had some success. So that's what we're going to try first. Okay, great. Um, so does the use of the string trimmers leave bits of plastic around as the string wears out? Uh, the basic thing is we're not using a string. We have a head on it that's like a nasty wire brush. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in regards to the vinegar, I see someone made a note that three gallons of water to one gallon of vinegar. So that's yeah, sounds like a lot of vinegar. It, you know, I think, yeah, it is a lot of vinegar. I don't know. That's used somewhat in gardens, but um, our, uh, so the hydromechanical tool seems to clear small areas of weed seedlings at a time. Is that accurate? Um, yeah, we're doing, uh, we're working in seven by seven meter plots as test plots. Um, we think we can make it more efficient with with the right equipment, but we want to make sure that it actually works well enough in enough places at Edgewood so that uh, it's worth the capital investments and the continued investment. Um, you know, we were just, our experience at the horse park and um, the uh, and at Edgewood have shown that, you know, we get lasting effects. And that's what's important is that we, we have a way of increasing the native perennial cover that takes up the room so there'll be less non-native annuals. Okay. And the water that's used, is that um, sustainable somewhat? Um, we're going to use somewhere on the order of 1,500 gallons um, for the plots we have. Um, we're working on, you know, decreasing the um, amount of water necessary. Um, we found out we can get a construction uh, valve where you go up to a fire hydrant and they, you know, they pay for it. So, you know, the point is that it really only needs to be done once to get things started off. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the sustainability is whatever your initial effort is, but the lasting effects, I think, are okay. really important. So we're giving it a really good test to see if it's something we want to pursue in the future. Great. Um, question, are you limiting reseeding to plants that are locally native or expanding the palette to California natives from nearby areas? And I well, think we have a question there. Yeah, right. So um, we have we have what we call our boutique seeds, which are the ones grown at Edgewood Farms. Um, pretty small amounts, but very diverse. We worked with uh, folks at Hedgerow Farms to find seeds that were basically native to uh, San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County. So we're pretty local. It's not strictly Edgewood stock, but it's about as low. We're trying to make that trade off between having seeds, enough seeds to do something with and keeping it local. All right. We're not, we're not bringing in seeds from anywhere. Great. So we had a question about what a forb is, but I think we answered that. Um, not everyone is always familiar with that term. So it's not a grass, not a shrub, not a tree wildflowers more or less yeah wildflowers um you know we we talk a lot about the being strong with the forbs and may the forbs be with you <laughs> and uh, we all we all gave each other star wars names so <laughs> i'm, I'm scooby wan kenobi uh, crystal is princess leia this is something i never knew about <laughs> yeah well we get pretty silly out in the field so it's great. And so a couple of butterfly questions. I yeah. see a, a monarch almost every day visiting my lantana lately. Is it maybe it is the same individual? Yeah, it, they uh, they definitely have their trap lines that they 
And, you know, one of the issues with the monarchs is that a lot of them are starting to breed when they should be overwintering because people have planted a lot of the tropical milkweed. And uh, it's, a, it's a real, you know, kind of a problem for the migration. Um, but given how much they've collapsed, it might be this, you know, the rescue for the monarchs in the Western US. I mean, we're still trying to come to grips with this. I mean, one of the things that happened this year is they showed up, started showing up in coastal California, but there was October was so mild that they just didn't have the incentive to get to the coast. And a lot of them kind of didn't go into diapause or reproduct, stop their reproduction. So they're breeding. Unfortunately, this time of year, uh, caterpillars develop really slowly because of the temperatures that a lot of them become deformed. So it can be an ecological trap. Um, it's incredibly complicated. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, again, we're still trying to come to grips with this. Um, I think the term we're using among ourselves is we're all devastated. You know? Is what? Devastated. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Talamy last month um, also spoke, if anybody didn't hear that talk, if you're interested in monarchs and butterflies in general, I encourage you to uh, check our YouTube channel for um, Doug Tellamy's talk last month. Um, so uh, are you increasing, you are increasing the plantago erecta, the dwarf plantain to help the bay checker spot? Yeah, in the serpentine grasslands, uh, it responds really strongly to the mowing and getting rid of the Italian ryegrass. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, continued nitrogen deposition from Highway 280, so you know, the thing with the bay checker spots reintroduction is we're fighting an uphill battle against the ongoing nitrogen deposition, which we feel like we have some handle on. But we're getting this uh, kind of climate whiplash between really dry years and really wet years. And because of the lack of topography in the butterfly area, tends to be really sensitive to those wild swings in weather. There's not much buffering. And do you have uh, atmospheric equipment out there to, to monitor the... Not now. Um, we, we had two campaigns, one back in 2002, 2003, and then some folks from UC Santa Cruz remeasured it in uh, 2011. Um, the, big, the big result of that is that nitrogen oxides are coming down. So the uh, the NOx coming out of tailpipes came down a lot. That's because we put the catalytic converters on the cars, but at the same time, the ammonia went up a little bit because that's produced by the catalytic converters. There's like mm -hmm. no free chemical lunch out there. Right. And you know, that's a trend that's been seen all across the United States is that NOx levels have come down because it's a regulated pollutant. And like the Air Resources Board has very strict limits on emissions. But ammonia is not, uh, largely because of the ag lobby. But it's a, in some ways, it's a more potent deposition agent than uh, the nitrogen oxides are. So it's not going away until- Electric cars, I guess. Yeah, until we all drive electric cars. Yeah. So, um... Are you working out from the heavy native populations or the more pristine yes. populations and out into the great unwashed, as someone put it, protecting? Yeah, your um, yeah the, our, our plots were very much focused on areas where we have a good, um, good nucleus of native perennial species. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, I guess more clarification of some of the hydro treatments. How do you target non-natives with the hydro method and not affect the natives? And how does it compare to just mechanical scraping? Okay, well, those are really good questions. We basically get rid of everything that's above ground in the post-germination period. Mm -hmm. The uh, it's mainly non-native annuals. There probably are some native annuals, but a lot of the natives take a while to germinate. So you know, that they may uh, still be there. Um, and then, you know, you've basically taken off 
the tops of the native perennials, but they resprout really vigorously. So that's sort of the key is that, you know, they survive it. And uh, actually they do, sometimes they'll do a lot better because you've gotten rid of the accumulated thatch in the bunch grasses and really freshen things up. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's the kind of fundamental thing we're trying to encourage. We are trying the, what we call scrub mowing, which is a mechanical treatment. Um, scraping is, uh, might take off a little bit too much. Um, and it's real, it's hard to implement that at scale without heavy equipment. Um, we had some luck with it at the horse park in some areas, uh, at least in the first few years. Uh, the one thing you totally get out of it is an incredible stand of uh, Juncus buffonius. It's just it's amazing how much of that is down there in the soil, just waiting for a big disturbance. Hmm. Great. Um, we have some questions about uh, could it would be possible on serpentine to just uh, do would wildflowers come back if you just did string trimming over several years? Um, yeah, I mean, that's how we are treating the serpentine is it's, you know, it's basically string cutting. Mm -hmm. And we find that we get an immediate response that it doesn't have to be done every year. Um, sometimes we'll mow it twice, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, the effect lasts like four or five years unless we get a really heavy grass growth year. So how many years have you been doing the string trimming there? Uh, we figured we did it at scale first in 2005. So we end up doing, I don't know, three to five acres each year. You know, mm -hmm. Crystal and I'll go out and walk the area and say, okay, it looks like this could use it. You know, this area doesn't need it. So um, mm -hmm. it's all pretty, you know, pretty controlled in terms of where we do it. And, you know, County Parks is provided crews for it. So that's really good. Right. We have some questions um, from uh, someone who's been working within a couple of miles in Woodside doing string trimming. So Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So um, Craig has some questions for you. So uh, let's see. And the difference in nitrogen deposition in different places like in Woodside, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot depends. Are you upwind or downwind of Highway 280 with the prevailing winds around here? Um, mm -hmm. You know, by the time you get down into Silicon Valley and down on Coyote Ridge, you're catching every, you know, catching the whole plume. Yes, the funnel. It's of people. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, do you have, uh, do you have someone prepared to take over? Someone asked you, do you have uh, folks lined up ready to take up your mantle? Oh, well, I, you know, I have Crystal and Jimmy and Marissa and Chris at Creekside, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. You know, they're, I've trained them to do a lot of good things. And, <laughs> uh, so I can move on and do the next and, interesting thing. And this is being documented, right? If, can people go find this information on? Uh, we're, we're writing up reports. Um, yeah, we have an annual report on the checker spot butterfly and the thorn man and mm -hmm. uh, you know we're still kind of digesting the first few years of the green grass project. So um, unfortunately I have to go be go chair a American Geophysical Union session. That's my other engagement. It's all about okay. nitrogen so Okay, well, I'm getting more questions. Um, so, but some of them are pretty, pretty big. Why don't you keep them and send them to me an email? And... I will do. Okay. Hey, thanks so, uh, I'm really happy, uh, really glad I had a chance to present this. I think people are really engaged with this. Really happy to see them. We look forward to a great spring. Yeah. We'll come visit visit Edgewood again this. Yeah. Spring. Okay. Thanks. Good Thank rain. You. Thank, Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks everybody for your questions. We'll make sure and um, pass them on to Stu. And this is our last talk of the year. So thank you everybody for joining us, but we'll be back early in January. So please check out our website or join and join our 
email news list so you can stay on top of all the cool things we have coming up. And uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to be ending our session now. So uh, have a great holiday.